Hello everyone, I hope that you can all hear and see me. Uh, my name is Dr Nikki Rust and I will be uh, running your webinar today on researching wildlife poaching. Now just to make sure that you can all hear me and that you can um, access the chat box, can you just type in yes can hear you and um, if you would like you can also let me know where in the world you are as well. Um, our, this um, lecture was originally meant for just the Newcastle University students, but I thought, you know, given uh, the coronavirus crisis, why not just open it up to everyone around the world um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to um, learn something here. So, wonderful. Um, I can see we've got 34 people here and I'm just looking at the chat box. We've got people from all over the world, gosh, even from Iran. Switzerland, USA, fantastic. Well, very exciting that you're from everywhere. Brilliant. Well, we'll just um, give it a couple more minutes um, to allow the uh, latecomers to arrive. I know that some people um, had to download and install Zoom on their computers. So um, let's just give it a, a minute or two longer. Um, if you do have any questions or um, anything that you, you wanted to let me know, then again, just use the chat box. Um, I'll put it on the side of the window um, as we're going along and can answer your questions um, as we're going. And we've got a couple more people that are just joining us. So just to let you know, I'm an environmental social scientist and I work at Newcastle University. Um, I've just seen someone who says I don't have your voice. It seems like everyone else can hear me. So if you can either turn up your speakers, make sure that they're working, then um, that would be wonderful. Brilliant. So I have had a varied career to date where I've spent um, more than half of it working um, in uh, uh, wildlife conservation organisations such as WWF um, and I'm, uh, I've spent the rest of it working in academia trying to understand what actually um, affects our behaviour as, as it relates to wildlife. So why do we decide to be more or less sustainable? Um, I've spent a fair amount of time whilst I was working at WWF looking at wildlife poaching um, and I've also done research on it. And today we'll be having a little look at some of the work that we've been um, doing this, uh, doing on this. I'm just seeing it in the chat box that, uh, that people, some people can hear and some people can't hear. Can, can lots of people hear? Are there just a few people that can't hear? I'll just wait, yes. So some people can hear. So if you can't hear, then it's, it's your computer rather than mine so make sure that your uh, your speakers are working okay brilliant right well thank you very much for joining so let's get cracking okie dokie well first of all i thought i would just start with um a basic question what actually is poaching um there are lots of different definitions out there but um here um what i'm referring to in poaching is illegal killing or taking of wild plants or animals so it's not just um mammals that we're talking about here um it's actually all biodiversity and it isn't just killing um it's also for instance um that there's a, a problem for instance in south africa with um, people poaching uh, very very rare plants from the wild so they take them from the wild um, and use them in the illegal wildlife trade poaching is not legal killing though so for instance trophy hunting um, whilst lots of people uh, may be morally opposed to trophy hunting um, it is still legal in certain circumstances so what makes poaching is not the fact that you're killing or um, taking an, a plant or animal it's it's whether it's legal or illegal great so there are links between poaching and legal hunting um, and this can work in in both ways for instance if if uh, say trophy hunting was um, previously legal and then became illegal there can be a backlash um, by the local community who um, you know had, had previously benefited from trophy hunting and then they go out um, and poach 
Equally, there's some research that shows that um, if you have legal hunting, for instance, um, in the US uh, with, with wolves in some states, um, when, it, when you have a legal cull, that can then send a signal uh, to the general public that it's okay to kill wild animals. And so sometimes poaching goes up. It's a very, very complicated topic. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll uh, be showing you the nuances and the complexities uh, within this, this talk today. Legal hunters can become illegal poachers overnight if the law is changed. So a number of years ago in Botswana, for instance, uh, the, the Sun, um, an indigenous group of people living in Botswana, um, they have spent most of their livelihoods um, uh, hunting wild game there, but this became illegal um, overnight because of the, the government making it illegal. Um, and so it, it's not just people being nasty and going out there and, um, you know, killing elephants and rhinos for money. Um, people, people hunt wildlife le legally and illegally for lots of different reasons, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So poaching only becomes part of the illegal wildlife trade if whatever they've taken from the wild is then sold on. So there is a difference between poaching and illegal wildlife trade, but um, they can be linked. Okay, so why do people poach? There are lots of reasons. Uh, I think this is probably the, the most um, commonly known. People are poaching for meat, for fibre, for instance, um, to make clothing um, or other parts to consume or make things with. Um, so, for instance, uh, again, in South Africa, people um, can poach uh, leopards and they skin their the hides and use them in traditional ceremonies. There's also traditional medicine. So I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, in, in Asia, for instance, this can be um, a, a reason why people poach wildlife. Um, bears, for instance, in Asia are poached for the bile that they produce. Oh gosh, we've just gone to the end. Let me just go back to my slide. Um, we also have people poaching um, for cultural reasons. Um, for instance, in Kenya, uh, there are certain communities where um, for, for men, they have to prove their manlyhood um, and their, their, that they've reached adulthood by going out and killing a lion. And, and because um, technically this is illegal in Kenya, <coughs> it's classed as poaching. By the way, I have a bit of a cough, but it's not coronavirus, don't worry. Uh, okay, so people also kill um, uh, animals or poach uh, animals and, um, for fear. For instance, in Madagascar, um, there is um, a, a bit of a culture, cultural norm there for people to be scared of certain uh, types of lemurs, such as the eye eye, as they're seen as very scary creatures, and so they're killed because of that. Human wildlife conflict as well, where you have, for instance, um, predators coming and killing livestock, and so people going out and killing those predators, and it, it's classed as poaching if it is illegal to kill those predators. And then, of course, we have the simple reason for money. People are doing it to get money. Great. So we've heard lots in the news over the last couple of years about the effects of poaching on wildlife. And here's um, on the right hand side of it here. We've got an infographic from WWF having that's showing the numbers of rhinos that have been poached in South Africa over time. Fortunately, there does seem to be a little bit of a decrease uh, more recently, and it seems perhaps because of the, um, the increase in enforcement in, in the area. So, of course, uh, poaching can reduce wildlife populations, but it can also destabilise local communities. So, for instance, if you have um, organised criminal gangs coming into the local communities that have, have found out that you can make lots of money, for instance, from rhino horn or ivory, then um, this can really, really destabilise the local community. And if the, um, the illegal wildlife trade items are then traded on, it can sometimes, although rarely, fund militias. There has been um, lots of press coverage uh, a number of years ago about the ivory trade um, funding certain um, terrorist or militia groups in, in Africa. 
actually research has shown that this has been a little bit overblown but in rare instances this can happen but i did also want to point out that the effect of poaching can sometimes be positive for, for those that are involved so for those people that are poaching um, uh, wildlife because they are perhaps destroying their crops or um, killing people or um, uh, killing their, their livestock, then it can reduce that conflict. Equally, um, we can have issues where it can maintain culture. So for instance, I mentioned about um, some of the, the people within uh, Kenya that, that kill lions uh, as part of their culture. And then it can support livelihoods as well. So sometimes people are poaching because they have absolutely no other choice because they need the meat or the money. Um, and this, uh, this is a way of life for them. So yes, there are huge negatives when it comes to biodiversity conservation for poaching, but we have to realize that there are positive sides to the people, to some people that are involved and that's why they're going about and doing this. Okay. So this uh, webinar was meant to be about uh, focusing on how exactly can we re research into poaching. Now there are lots of different approaches to this. I'm just going to focus on six of them. So we've got ecology, sociology, psychology, economics, policy and environmental crime. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what each of these, um, these disciplines can do to help us study poachers, poaching. Just uh, as, a, as a caveat, I am a social scientist, um, and so most of my uh, research has been on the social side of wildlife conservation. I know a little bit about ecology, but not a lot. Um, but I would argue that actually the, the causes of poaching are human caused. The reason why um, you know, we've got declines in biodiversity across the world generally is because of human behavior and so actually the social sciences play a really important part in helping to understand and of course to um, address wildlife declines including as the result of, of poaching. Okay so let's um, have a little bit of a look at these different approaches. So first of all we've got ecology um, and how you can use ecology to study poaching is, is just as an example we, we've got um, here, you can estimate um, the effects of poaching on wildlife before and after an intervention. For instance, if um, there was an increase in um, enforcement in an area, you could do a study to look before and after that enforcement to see how it's affected poaching rates. And one of the ways that you could do that is through population studies where, for instance, you can do aerial counts or camera traps. Next, we've got sociology. Um, and this can be where we're looking at questions such as um, societal influences on poaching, for example, societal norms, whether um, there's a norm within a culture that it's okay to, to kill certain animals or not, as the case may be. And we can look at this through lots of social <coughs> sociological techniques such as interviews, um, surveys, participant observation. I'll talk a little bit more about these techniques um, as one of my case studies later on. Um, then we've got psychology. Um, so rather than looking at the interactions between different people within a community, psychology looks at the individual themselves and the psychological drivers of poaching, for instance, fear. Um, the, the types of approaches to this are quite similar to sociology, like with interviews, we can also run experiments as well. And then we've got economics, where we can look at things like um, <coughs> supply and demand. Um, we can look at um, using choice experiments or contingent valuation or even uh, market studies. Now, if you haven't heard of the organisation Traffic, Traffic are perhaps the, the biggest um, wildlife trade uh, NGO in the world and they do quite a lot of uh, market studies where for instance they'll go out to um, legal and illegal wildlife markets and look at the amount of supply of these products. Um, so that's just another way that we can look into this. Then there are lots of things that we can look at in terms of policy and governance. For instance, how does changing um, a policy affect poaching? And we can do policy analysis or interviews 
And a different, um, well, like one subsection of policy is looking at environmental crime. Um, and we can look at things like how does changing penalties um, for poaching affect the rates? Now, there's been lots of um, focus, particularly by um, animal welfare and animal rights organisations, to really ramp up the penalties um, involved uh, for people that, that do poach. Um, it was one of the things that I was looking at when I worked um, as the, the wildlife advisor at WWF. And actually, the, the evidence shows that in some circumstances, um, in fact, in quite a lot of circumstances, increasing the, the penalties um, doesn't actually result in reduced poaching. It is really complicated. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from this is that the humans are really, really complicated. Um, and uh, just assuming that, that simple solutions can help solve the problem is a nice idea, but um, perhaps not that useful in the grand scheme of things. So when we're talking about methods, um, I also just wanted to quickly point out um, the, the difference between qualitative and quantitative approaches. Now, I'm sure some of you have come across this already, um, but there may be some of you who haven't. So there are, there are different ways that we can go about research. Qualitative ways tend to focus more on um, looking at inductive um, ways of, of kind of trying to understand underlying drivers. And, and when we look at qualitative research, it tends to be the why. Why do people try to do things or not? Um, whereas with quantitative, of course, it's trying to quantify things. And so you're looking more at kind of the what's and perhaps the who's. Um, there's no right or wrong way to, to um, go about um, looking at uh, research on into poaching, but whether you choose qualitative or quantitative really depends on your research questions and also, I guess, your, your training as well. So I come more from a qualitative background. However, I've got two case studies that I'll be showing you in just a minute. Um, one is qualitative and one is quantitative, just to give you a bit of a feel for the different approaches and, and what kind of questions they can answer and what kind of methods you can use. OK, so let's go on to our first example. <coughs> now, I have a little bit of um, an Africa bias here because I've spent um, much of my working career um, focusing on Africa, so I do apologise. <coughs> But as you may know, um, much of Africa does have um, huge issues with wildlife poaching. So um, this particular example is going to be a qualitative, qualitative example of how to study poaching. And actually, um, the original reason for me uh, doing this study was more to look at human wildlife conflict on um, livestock farms in Namibia. However, I accidentally seemed to find um, with this qualitative approach that poaching was um, uh, hugely important within this. And I just wanted to, to, to mention that that's one of the benefits of doing qualitative research, <coughs> that you can um, find uh, things that you may never have intended by having quite a broad approach to things rather than with them. Um, quantitative studies you have you, you tend to have quite a narrow approach and you've got your um your hypotheses that, that are based on pre-existing research whereas with qualitative research um sort of the world is your oyster and um you can go in like i did with with this i'd used a grounded theory approach which um rather than um spending a lot of time reading the literature and then using that to um to, to focus your research and to, to work out what your study um, research questions are. You go in with a very open mind and kind of let the data show you what's important. Now, I understand that this is probably a very topsy-turvy way of doing research for, for quantitative researchers, but there are definitely benefits of going in with an open mind um, and using qualitative approaches, which we'll be able to see now. So, uh, like I say, the research was based in Namibia, which is a very dry country, is in sub-Saharan Africa, and much of the country is used for livestock production. Interestingly as well, most of the wildlife in Namibia is found outside of protected areas on these farms. So um, I really wanted to understand the interaction between people, livestock and wildlife in these areas, and particularly as it relates to human wildlife conflict. But accidentally, I seem to also find, find one of the reasons of why um, poaching was happening on these farms. 
Now I used qualitative methods um, and these uh, tended to focus on qualitative interviews and participant observation. If you haven't heard of participant observation before, um, I'll just uh, give you some little examples in a moment, but just to give you, if you haven't ever been to Namibia or know where Namibia is, <coughs> it's in the southern part um, of Africa, next to uh, Botswana, South Africa and Angola. Um, and I thought I'd give you a little bit more of a geographical context because it's quite important, um, as, as you'll find out from the results. So Namibia was previously colonised by a number of different groups. Um, first of all, the Germans and then the, um, the, the white South Africans. And for a long time, whilst it was under um, colonisation, the, um, the, the white minority, um, roughly around 3,000 families, owned a huge portion of the land. Now, since uh, Namibia got its independence, there has been land reforms to, to try to ensure that the indigenous peoples do actually um, get a portion of this land. And this is actually really important to understand um, why people do the things that they do in their environment. It's really critical to understand um, the historical and the, and the governance aspects uh, of these contexts. So on this, um, this map, you'll be able to see the, the green are the protected areas, the, the dark brown are the communal conservancies, um, and the, the green are the commercial areas. And I was focusing my work um, in this sort of oval, <coughs> in the commercial areas. Um, and all of the area in kind of the, um, the central um, parts of Namibia are livestock farming. There's not enough rainfall for crops in the vast majority of this. So participant observation. It, it's been uh, explained by some people as deep hanging out. It's um, an anthropological method where you go into a community as a researcher and you basically learn about that community by informally hanging out with them, but by, but by going along and learning about livestock farming. So I spent, um, well initially I spent a year living in Namibia and then um, went back to, to go and live on livestock farms to learn about the livestock there, to learn about how they were looked after and about how people interacted with wildlife. So I was um, going along and um, observing how people cared for their livestock, <coughs> the people that were involved, so the livestock um, workers and also the, the, the farmers. Now on these commercial farms, the commercial farms, 95% of them or so are owned by um, white people that tend to be um, uh, either German descents or um, South African uh, white descents. And without exception, the farm workers are black. You may be wondering why is this important, but bear with me, you'll understand in a moment. Okay, so through, um, through the participant observation, through spending eight months of working on the livestock farms, of going out every single day and learning how people look after their livestock, who's looking after them, and, and doing interviews with 60 farmers and their workers, here's what I found. Now, lots of studies in the past have um, noted that, at least when it comes to human wildlife conflict, um, looking after your livestock and, and using preventative measures such as fences and dogs can, um, can protect your livestock from predators. And this means that you're less likely to go out and need to hunt that predator to kill that predator. <coughs> and that's definitely something that I noticed here as well. However, I was quite interested in the relationship between the farmer and his workers. Um, and the more time I spent there, the more I realised actually this seems to be critical in that the, the management of the farm comes down to the, the manager and his employees. So the more I looked into this, the more I realised that there was a trend happening here. Um, and I noticed the, the, the commercial farmers, they are very rich, they live in these palatial houses, um, they often have swimming pools and horses and numerous cars, whereas the, the farm workers tend to live in squalor, for want of a better word, um, in incredibly small houses, um, 
they are often given incredibly small wages and sometimes they don't even have enough money to go out and buy food properly for, their, for themselves and their family. Why is this important? Well, if you don't have enough money to buy food, then these workers were going out and poaching wildlife, particularly the game. This is um, an oryx here, which is an antelope. Along with that, the farmers were going and um, stealing livestock. Now, uh, this picture here is not actually someone stealing livestock. Um, it was one of the workers there. Um, but I did find that on in these places where, where the workers were not treated well, were not paid enough, um, where their conditions were really, really terrible, it gave them the, the incentive, the motivation to not only go and poach game, to poach wildlife, but to steal livestock and blame it on predators. So either they would steal livestock to kill for meat or they would sell it on so that they then had enough money to um, go and uh, buy food. And this then resulted in, um, in human wildlife conflict where, for instance, um, if the, the workers are going out and killing um, wild game to eat, this is reducing the wild populations of um, prey animals and so predators are much more likely to then have to resort to killing livestock. But it also meant that the farm workers who had gone out and um, killed the livestock then went to their their manager the, the farmer and said oh hey i saw a lion on the farm yesterday and he took one of your cows so the worker was blaming predators for the missing livestock when in actual fact it was him who was stealing it so the farmer then goes out and um thinks that he has a worse problem with lions than he actually does and this is this all then comes down to the relationship between the farmer and his workers so to kind of summarize this the farms that had less reported poaching, theft and livestock predation, depredation, I found that the workers had a higher reported salary, they had higher job satisfaction, they had better living conditions, felt more respected, they worked on the same farm for many years and they received more training on how to do their job well, they were more motivated then to go out and do a good job, and they hadn't been threatened by the, the farmer. You'd be aghast at some of the stories that I was um, learning from, from some of the farm workers that had been beaten and terrorized by some of these farms. Um, and again, with the, the, the farms with le these less reported problems, they received extra, extra perks such as like pensions and um, more meat and travel. Oh, we've got a question here. How did you find out that the workers were stealing livestock? Surely they wouldn't admit that. Well, it's one of the benefits of um, doing this, um, this qualitative approach where you really embed yourself within the community. So because I was living there for such a long period of time and had built up trust with the, the farm workers, that was going out every single day with the farm workers and actually the farmer, whilst they were there sometimes, it was actually down to the farm workers to do most of the, the, the work. So I built up a very good relationship with the farm workers and through this these eight months of spending time with them they would tell me um either of instances that had happened on that particular farm or of neighboring farms um of these things that are happening um it was less likely that they would incriminate themselves but more saying oh well this previous person that worked here this is what had happened so like i say it is one of the great benefits of um of doing this qualitative work oh we've got another question here were there any risks to the workers of publishing the results if they knew you'd been living and studying there? Uh, we will come to that question at the end because we're going to be talking about ethics, which is a hugely important part of any research, but particularly when it comes to um, studying things that, that co could cause unintended harms. So yeah, bear with me, we'll cover that. Great. So um, I then decided to, uh, so this, this work was part of my PhD a number of years ago, and I thought, do you know what, to, to kind of create a conceptual idea of what's happening here, I'm going to turn to Microsoft Paint <laughs> and to, to put it all um, in a diagram. So I, I thought, do you know what's happening here? It's there's, there's these underlying drivers that are causing poaching and human wildlife conflict. And it's almost like a volcano that's bubbling at the bottom. And what comes out the top is poaching and human wildlife conflict. So you start at the bottom with the, the political history 
of the country. Where, as I mentioned at the start, um, Namibia had been colonised um, and there had been political and social tensions because of that. Um, and because of the, the colonisation for such a long period of time, it created these macro socio-economic problems. And what I mean there is that still even today, the vast majority of the land in Namibia is owned by the white minority. Again, I think it's something like about 3,000 families own the majority of the land. Um, and this is, these tend to be in the areas that have the most productive um, livestock farming land as well. So it creates a tension. Um, you have these micro socioeconomic problems where the farmers, the white farmers, are earning loads of money and the farm workers are earning basically nothing. And this then causes, again, tensions on the farm. And so in areas where the farmer is not looking after his workers, he's then, the, the workers are then almost forced to have to find a way to make a living. And so they're more likely to go out there and poach wildlife and, and to steal livestock. And this results in human wildlife conflict. So that's a kind of a, a, a summary of, of the, the research from the qualitative um, work that I did. But obviously this was qualitative, so we couldn't quantify any of this. So I think a year after I published this, I then got contacted by um, some researchers that, that wanted to do a quantitative study um, on Namibia and to ha have a look at um, exactly how this farmer worker relationship could be affecting poaching. And I'll talk about um, that now. So how exactly do you quantify an illegal behavior? Because it is illegal and so people don't really want to talk about it. You can ask people directly, but they tend to lie. You can observe, but it can be very difficult and potentially dangerous as well. If, if for instance, you're trying to observe um, you know, uh, rhino poachers, you could end up getting yourself killed. So there is a, a growing um, uh, literature out there about using indirect methods to ask questions to quantify illegal behaviour. There are a number of different methods out there, but I'm just going to focus on the randomised response technique, which I will talk about in a little bit more detail now. Now bear with me, this sounds like an odd way to collect data <laughs> and it is a little bit complicated so please do ask questions as we go along because when I first heard about this I couldn't wrap my head around it. Okay what happens? We have a structured survey but it's done in a very very different way to a normal questionnaire and it maintains confidentiality. Chance decides whether the question to be um, whether the question is to be answered truthfully or yes regardless of the truth. Now, this sounds confusing, but let me explain how this works. Okay. So, for instance, we're trying to work out how frequently um, drafts are poached. So we want to know, perhaps in, in the last month, have you poached a giraffe? Uh, and you go out and, and you ask someone. But before they answer, you ask them to flip a coin. Again, bear with me with this. The coin is hidden to the interviewer, so the interviewer cannot see the coin. So the, the respondent, they flip a coin and the interviewer then instructs them to answer. They have to answer yes if the coin turns up tails and they have to answer truthfully if it, turn, if, if it lands on heads. Again, the, the interviewer cannot see how, how the coin lands. So remember, they, they, they have to answer yes, even if they haven't poached a giraffe in the past month, they have to answer yes. Um, and you also have to uh, uh, tell the people that, you know, you're not going to be reporting them to anyone. Um, again, we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the ethical uh, part of it at the end, end of this lecture. Um, so to, to make sure that this works, really, you have to maintain confidentiality with, um, with your respondent. Now, there are a few more steps as well into this as, uh, as we go along. So, as you'll know from basic uh, maths, um, when you flip a coin, you're going to have a 50-50 chance, pretty much, of it landing heads or tails. Half the people are going to get tails and the other half um, are going to uh, get heads. So, when um, they get, uh, uh, when they have to be forced to answer yes, um, you can then model that uh, 
given we know uh, various probabilities of it being heads or tails. Whereas half the people are going to answer um, truthfully, they have to answer truthfully if it, if it lands um, on heads. So you can then calculate the probability of the people who um, haven't poached, because remember, it, if they're answering it truthfully, that they can answer yes or no, whereas if they're being forced to answer, they have to answer yes. So that's also very important within this. And with, with a basic um, modelling of this, you can then infer how many people have poached. So you know um, the probability of it landing um, on heads, um, of being forced to say yes, and you also know the probability of it landing on tails. Um, and when landing on tails, some people are going to say no, some people are going to um, say yes. So we can, we can work out the probability of um, whether people have poached a giraffe or not. So, how did this work in practice? Okay, so it's another um, example in, in Namibia. I apologise for that. Now, what's happening in Namibia is, um, like in quite a lot of places in Africa, vultures are accidentally and sometimes purposefully killed. And the reason why they're purposefully killed is... Um, for instance, if you've got a lot of um, poaching going on in an area and carcasses are, are laying around the landscape, vultures, by their nature, go down and then um, feed on the carcass. So if you have a lot of vultures circling around a carcass, it can indicate that there is a carcass there. And so it can alert enforcers um, that there may have been a poaching incident. So sometimes vultures are purposefully killed and the way how they've done that is uh, the way that how that happens is um, the carcass that has been poached um, on purpose is then um, covered in poison and so the vultures come down and they eat the carcass and then they're killed. However vultures are also killed accidentally um, because in Namibia like in lots of places around the world um, there are predators roaming around the, the environment and um, Livestock farmers don't like them, and so some of the times they they put out poison for the predator, for like a, a lion or a cheetah or a, le a leopard to, to come and eat. So, for instance, they they might get um, a sheep carcass. They put poison on the sheep carcass, and the the cheetah comes along and eats the carcass and then dies. Um, but um, an unintended consequence of that is that the vulture may come down and eat the sheep that has been poisoned that was meant for the predator, but the vulture accidentally gets killed as well. Now, poison use is, like in many parts of the world, illegal, and it's also illegal to kill vultures in Namibia as their protected species. So we wanted to know how frequently are farmers using poison, which is illegal, and killing vultures, which is also illegal. Okay, um, here's another map of Namibia and um, the black dots that we've got here are the farmers that we surveyed using the randomised response technique. So um, like with flipping the coin, actually what we did is we used a dice, it's a similar kind of approach, um, so it's using probability and you're forcing, like in half of the instances, people have to say yes, in the other half they have to answer truthfully. So we, um, we interviewed 412 farmers and ask them various different questions um, related to both legal and illegal behaviour. And here's what we found. So the estimated proportion of farmers who kill the predator was about almost 80% of them. Um, now, killing some predators in Namibia is legal. For instance, jackals and, and caracals, it's legal to kill them, but it's not legal to kill things that are protected like lions. And remember, as I said, it's also not legal to kill vultures. Um, and, and actually, none of the farmers admitted to killing a vulture, but they did admit to illegally using poison, and they also admitted that they, they may use poison in the future. Now, another way that we also um, try to understand illegal behaviour is we asked people um, about what their neighbours do, because sometimes you find that um, if someone assumes what well, says that their neighbour is doing something, it could well be 
that they believe that there is a norm within that community that it's okay to do this illegal behavior and actually it's a reflection on their own behavior themselves and so what we found with um, asking people about um, the proportion of, of neighbors who they thought doing things <coughs> we, we, heard, we saw that perhaps 70 percent of uh, their neighbors uh, were killing predators without a permit a few percent might be killing vultures um, about 20 percent were um, using poison to kill predators but very very few were using it specifically to focus on vultures now we've got another two things here that we looked at as well um, losing dogs i.e um, predators coming along and killing dogs and the reason why we put these questions in there is actually informed from the qualitative work that I had done previously, where it seemed that some farmers um, were extremely angry at predators that had killed their beloved dogs. Um, often these are working dogs that come out with a farmer every single day and they've got very, very deep, strong bonds with their dogs. Um, so as you can imagine, if any of you were a pet owners, um, if, if your pet had been killed by a fox, then I'm sure you'll be very angry and perhaps some of you may want to go out there and kill some foxes. So we looked at um, the extent to which that might be important for um, <coughs> predicting whether people are using poison um, to purposefully or otherwise kill vultures. But actually, we found that there wasn't much of an effect there. So what actually did affect farmers' use of poison? And we learned this from, um, along with doing the randomised response technique, we did um, a survey to ask various different questions as well. And we found the most important things that were um, uh, influencing farmers to, to use poison were the number of small stock that they had on the farms. So Namibia is sort of split up with um, large farming uh, of cattle in the northern parts and um, farming of small stock, i.e. sheep and goats in the southern parts. And that's um, mostly due to the, the change in the climate that it's much drier in the south um, and sheep and goats do better in the south. So the more small stock that farmers had, uh, the more likely they were to use poison. Um, and this is partly, we think, because small stock are preyed upon more by um, smaller predators such as jackals and caracals. And jackals in particular are very cunning little things and can be quite difficult to kill in any other ways other than poison. So um, we were thinking that perhaps the reason why um, farmers were more likely to use poison where they had more small stock is because they were, they were purposefully trying to kill the jackals. We also found that there was a relationship between the percentage of the stock lost uh, and poison use, which is understandable that if you've got more livestock that are being killed by predators, you're probably going to be more incentivized to go out and kill predators um, and perhaps to, use, um, pre uh, perhaps to use poison. And then we also found that the total number of uh, livestock was important too. So the more livestock they had, the more likely they were to use poison. Um, this could well be for various different reasons. It, it could be that the more livestock you have, the more likely it is that some of them are going to be lost to predators. Um, there were lots of other things that we found as well. I'll just focus on a couple here. So remember I was saying um, that I wanted to have a little look about um, quantifying the relationship um, between farmers and their workers and seeing how that may influence poaching. And what we found here is that it was relatively important actually. Um, the relationship to farm workers did seem to influence poison use. So the, the farmers reported relationship with their farm workers. So I think the question was something like, um, uh, how good do you think your relationship is with your farm workers? Something like that. Um, and those that reported more negative relationships with their farm workers um, were more likely to use poison. So it does seem to be that there, there is um, uh, th this relationship going on between how badly farmers get on with their workers and then the extent to which perhaps farm, farm workers are going on to, to poach, um, but definitely the, the extent to which farmers are um, using poison. Okay. So we then went on uh, to map this across Namibia um, in, in the farms that we studied. Um, and you'll see here from the scale that the, the more blue the areas are, the less likely they were to use poison. Whereas as we go through to yellow and then amber and then red, the more likely they were to use poison. 
And as I mentioned earlier, as you get further down the country, you have more of these small stock areas where they, they um, farm in more goats and sheep. So it seems that, yes, having more goats and sheep, you're more likely to use poison. It could be because they've got more goats and sheep that they're using poison, but there could also be a cultural aspect here as well. Um, so you can see that there are certain areas um, that are really dark red, whereas there are some other areas in um, the southern part that, that are less red and perhaps even green. So it could be that within the dark areas, there is a cultural norm within that, that community that it's okay to use poison. Um, there's also uh, just south of Itosha National Park um, in the northern part of Namibia, there's a little pocket there where um, it's gone a little bit yellow green. And um, we think that's because there, there is um, a population of lions that come out of Itosha National Park in that particular area. Um, and there it could well be that the, the farmers are using poison to kill lions. We don't know for certain, but um, it, it sort of correlates with that sort of um, assumption. Okay, oh, we've got another question here. Could it just be that farmers who don't get along with their workers are just angry people? It could be. <laughs> yes, it could be. Um, and actually, uh, so when I was doing my qualitative work, um, I noticed, but I didn't write this down in any of my research, but I noticed those farmers that um, were less respectful towards their, their workers did seem to be more racist, um, more sexist, and yes, perhaps a bit more angry. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it could be that all of these things are correlated the more angry you are, the, the, um, the less well you treat everyone, including farmers and perhaps your livestock and wildlife. But didn't look into that properly, perhaps a research question for someone who is in this group to look at. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Okay, so what have we got here? Okay, so we're getting on to the last part here. We've got just 15 minutes left. So I wanted to focus a bit, as I mentioned, on ethics. Now, I would be really interested um, to hear from those of you that are, are in the group. Um, have any of you had ethical training on how to conduct research? And feel free to use the chat function here. You just say yes or no. Um, because I must admit that um, from my experience of um, instances in the UK, mm, there's not that much training. <laughs> and I'm seeing, yeah, some of them, some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. Um, yeah, some yes, some no. Okay. Right, well, I'll just give a very, very brief um, touching of ethics, uh, particularly as it relates to, to poaching. There are loads more research, um, re resources out there and I would really really encourage you to, to look at much more into the ethics of doing social science in particular as it relates to poaching this this is something that you're wanting to do in the future because it is critically important not only to protect yourself but also uh, the people that you're going to be um, working with so we've got a few things here that I wanted to cover Un unintended harms so here is what I mean um, by you, you go in and you do your research and um, there could be some, some unintended harms that come as a result of it. For instance, if, um, if you're doing the, the randomised response technique and um, you're in a little hut with, um, with uh, one of the local community and you're, you're asking them various different questions, um, for instance, have you poached a tiger in the last month? And it just so happens that a police officer walks past and, and hears and then comes in and says, oh my goodness, what's happening here? And then perhaps arrests the person that, that you're interviewing. Um, you really got to think about how can I protect my respondents and the people that I'm working with as much as possible to ensure that you aren't, in, aren't um, causing any unintended harms. Um, there are cultural considerations as well. Um, you may have come across the term parachute research. Um, if you haven't, then it, it basically means um, researchers coming in, usually from other parts of the world, piling on in into one particular area, collecting their data, and then buggering off. <laughs> excuse, excuse my French. Um, and the community is just kind of left thinking, oh, I've just been exploited by this researcher here and I haven't got anything back. Um, 
So please do really be aware of making sure that you're not one of those parachute researchers. Um, think about how can um, your research be used positively by your community? Um, are there any ways that you can continue on the work? Perhaps you could um, spend the final few weeks working with local NGOs um, to, to share the results of your research and to upskill them so that they continue the work on. Um, perhaps you could find some, some students, some, some master's students that may be able to continue the work on um, in the future. Also think as well about um, other cultural considerations, like again in, in Namibia it had this huge issue, shall we say, with, <coughs> with um, racism in the past. So think about how, how would you say, as, if you are a white person going into um, a black community that has suffered from racism, how could that affect your, not only your research but how could it affect the community as a whole? And how can you reduce those, those harms that perhaps could, could happen as a result of your research? Now, there are um, lots of fun, fantastic um, ethical um, experts out there that will be able to help you think through these things. Um, I, hopefully all universities now across the world do have um, an, an ethical committee that will help you uh, think, through, think these things through. I know that it, this is a bit more behind the time, shall we say, with some of the NGOs, some of the charities that are doing um, research here. So I would encourage those that haven't got um, formal ethical um, experts to perhaps reach out to, to either the free resources that you can get online ab about this um, or to maybe contacting some ethical um, experts that perhaps could think these things through with you. There are legal considerations as well. So um, again, thinking about um, when you're looking into to poaching, what do you do if you learn about some illegal behavior that could well cause negative consequences either to wildlife or to the local communities? And, and who are really you there to protect? You could, for instance, um, find out that there's um, a, a big poaching gang that are just about to go out and kill the last remaining tiger in a certain area. What do you do as a researcher? Do you just keep that information to yourself or do you go out and inform the police? What do you do? There are no real right or wrong um, answers here, um, but I would really think about your own personal safety here and also about how um, whatever you do, whatever you decide to do could have negative consequences um, either for the local communities or um, indeed anyone that, that tries to do research there in the future. Um, so we've then got to think about how do you protect vulnerable peoples um, and by vulnerable peoples this is in the widest possible form so um, not just say women and, and children, people of poverty, um, people maybe who have been um, abused, anyone that you can consider vulnerable. Um, if you have ethics committees, they can help think through um, how you can best protect vulnerable people. Um, and you also need to think about how you're going to protect yourself. So if you're going into a community and you're wanting to learn about illegal behaviour, <laughs> you could find yourself um, meeting some uh, rather negative people that um, may end up acting quite negatively towards you and, and perhaps you could suffer from goodness violence or, or something else. So again, if you if you are working at a university, really do uh, go in and grill your um, ethics committee about how you can ensure that you can protect yourself from any of these unintended um, harms as well. So that's just a really brief snapshot of ethics. It is an incredibly wide area, but I did really want to touch on it because it's so important, um, especially as <clears throat> more and more people are traveling around the world and, and going to new areas. Um, sometimes they don't have ethics training. So if, if your institution does not yet have ethics training, go and find out why, why it doesn't and perhaps request that you should get some ethical training because Honestly, I think every student out there and every NGO that is conducting research um, on people should get some form of ethics training. 
Okie dokie. Well, that was basically all I had to cover for um, this session. I've got some further reading here if you wanted to have a little bit more of a look into the, the studies that I've covered, as well as some fantastic um, organisations that are looking into the, these questions a bit more. Um, but I wanted to leave some time at the end to um, address any further questions or comments that, that you have from people. So if you've got any burning questions, then please do put them in the chat box and I will um, try and address them um, as much as I can in, in the five minutes that we've now got. So we've got a question from Daniel. How to request ethical education from ethical professors? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> Do you have anyone else within your institution that you may be able to bypass your unethical professors? Um, there should be people, if you're working at a university, there should be senior management um, that aren't academics that are, if nothing else, looking out at, for the reputation of the university and would be quite keen to ensure that there, there is some form of ethical training to just make, to reduce the chance of um, uh, negative unintended consequences. So, yeah. Try and have a look at your institution and see if there's if if you can't work with your professors. Is there someone else, um, perhaps in um, operations or um, the administration, that might be able to get on your side with this? So Carla asks, how hard was it to get information from farmers in terms of you being a female researcher? How did you overcome this challenge if there was any? Yep, good question. Um, that is something related to culture as well. So. Um, yeah, not only was I um, a, a white female, but I was coming from a, a different country, from the UK. So I, I would really encourage you to think before going to your study site, think about yourself as a researcher and how are you going to be perceived by the people that you're going to be working with. Um, there, there is some people who think, who, who have suggested that um, there can be benefits, um, but there's also challenges from being a, a different person. And I actually found with um, with myself that, that the farmers and the workers thought that I was so strange and so different that they were actually incredibly interested in me <laughs> and were really intrigued to find out more about me um, and were only too willing to invite me onto their farms. Just It was almost as if they were like, what are you? Who are you? Why are you coming to Namibia? I really want to learn more about you. So for me, um, I, I um, actually found it as, as a benefit. I have to admit, though, that there were some challenges. So um, uh, I found uh, on the first livestock farm that I, I went to, though it was meant to be embedding myself on this livestock farm, I ended up um, basically being kicked off by the farmer's wife. Because it turns out that the farmer's wife um, was uh, maybe a, little, a bit jealous of the, the farmer and didn't trust the farmer. And so said, listen, I don't want this young female uh, researcher being here. Sorry, you've got to go and live somewhere else. So, um, yeah, really do think about yourself as a researcher and how this could influence your research. OK. So we've got a question, is it possible to get the presentation slides? Yes, I will. Um, I've got them on my um, OneDrive and I'll send them round to you. I'll, also, the, um, the whole um, uh, webinar is being recorded, so I'll send that round as well. It, I'll put it on my Twitter. So if you have found this from my Twitter, I'll put it on my, my Twitter so you'll be able to, to find the slides and the webinar. Um, Roddy says, do you know if the angry farmers you mentioned earlier have changed at all following your research? I don't know. Um, haven't done any follow-up studies, so I'm not sure. Um, was it left to you to suggest they did better or did you hand over data to your... Oh, okay, so I, I didn't tell any, any farmer, you're racist, you need to change. Um, <laughs> what I did was, um, at the end of my research, um, I then went back to M Namibia and um, I presented my results and um, had a number of meetings, yes, with local NGOs and also with um, local governance institutions. Um, in the as sensitive way as possible without placing blame on anyone um, and I don't know whether or not they've then acted upon that. Um, yes you can share this with your students, don't worry I'll send around the link on my um, Twitter. How did you communicate with people in Namibia? English is the national language in Namibia which is quite handy. Um, so most people do actually speak English, um, there were a few people that didn't and so I had a translator there. 
how do you uh oh, sorry how do local farmers react to a forum in terms of giving correct response did you have any issues with language barriers yeah like i said didn't really have any um, issues with language barriers um in terms of giving correct response well i guess when it comes to social science particularly with the qualitative stuff i don't see any answer as a correct response in fact i just want to understand people's perceptions and it could well be that they are changing their answer based on on who i am um, so you've just got to really take that into consideration um, are there any policy suggestions that can come out of finding that negative relationship with farmers and workers correlates with wildlife theft and therefore poaching yes lots um, i talked about it in my phd thesis um, so i can also share that with you on twitter so you can have a little bit more of a look into that uh, do you think that collaborating with local researchers or having an assistant um, would go, on, go a long way to overcoming some of these challenges? Yes, but also do think about parachute research in that um, if you're only there for say six months, um, you employ someone for six months and then you go away, then that's got potentially negative consequences for that person that's just been employed for six months as well. And there are also ethical considerations to think about, about when it comes to publishing as well. Um, I personally think that if you've been involved in um, the, the research at all, including if you're a research assistant, your name should definitely be on the research paper. There's lots more we can talk about that. We're running out of time. I'll just answer this last one from Samantha um, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, what mitigation strategies would you suggest for human wildlife conflict um, with the farmers, uh, the farm workers and with the farmers, workers, relationship and poaching. That's covered in my PhD thesis, um, so you can have a look at that. I'll post the link on my Twitter. So we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for um, posting all of your questions in the chat box. Um, yeah, just uh, have a great day. Stay safe, keep inside, and um, I'll be posting everything on my Twitter. If you haven't got my Twitter, then it's at Nikki Rust, N-I-K-I-R-U-S-T. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye for now.